Um, I'm Sheila Lynn. I'm uh, an attorney in our um, real estate development group. Um, and uh, this isn't really my presentation because I'm going to hand this off to those who have much more experience in this area. Um, my involvement in this and how this all sort of came about to present this to real estate related um, clients was that I do a lot of uh, construction disputes and warranty claims and things like that, and we're always looking at websites and marketing materials to see what are the representations and what are the things that might open up the door for potential liabilities. And I uh, happened to be at a meeting with Kim um, a couple of months ago and realized that our area of looking at those things was very small and that there were many other exposures that we were not even thinking about, at least from my the real estate group perspective. So I was trying to educate our own group on the fact that these are things that we should be looking at, and we thought it would be a good idea to open it up to clients and let you uh, understand that there are some other things out there that we should be looking at, um, particularly things associated with uh, privacy and security, uh, as well as discrimination and liability associated with certain things that might be represented or not properly represented. Um, and things that, you know, you're accommodating, where, you know, the idea of uh, the ADA and fair housing and those things that are typically applicable to your physical property um, are also applicable to your sort of software and your uh, websites and other materials that you present. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, my colleagues here who are going to give you a little bit more detailed information. Uh, Kim Fan is, um, does more in the area of privacy and data security, um, and she does a lot of uh, work on representing clients and dealing with federal statutes and local and, and state statutes associated with that. And um, I'm going to say BC, but Ola BC, um, Okubadejo. I guess. Okay, sorry. Uh, um, she does more in the area of discrimination. She represents a lot of higher education institutions and business entities with respect to discrimination, civil rights, ADA, sexual harassment, and various other um, matters that also come into play in your presentations on your websites as well as you know, your other marketing materials. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim first, and if she wants to expand on her bio, I think that would be helpful for you guys. Um, it's a small group. We can certainly have interaction. If you want to ask questions, don't feel like you have to wait until the end of the presentation, um, but the presentation will continue anyway, so if you don't, you want to wait to the end, that's fine too. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. And then um, before we leave, I also want to point out for our real estate group, we're also doing another breakfast in uh, November. I think it's November 8th, which is more of a technical issue as well as keeping up with the Jetsons and dealing with autonomous vehicles in your uh, community. So keep your, that in mind, you're going to be getting an invitation probably over the next couple couple of days. I think, go ahead, Kim. Thanks, Sheila. And as Sheila mentioned, you know, feel free to jump in and ask questions at any time. We're, I'm going to cover a wide variety of topics in talking about your websites. But I just want to make clear at the beginning, you know, the big elephant in the room, security, is something that we can't tackle in the time that we have allowed. But it's absolutely a very high priority. If you want to talk about that separately, please feel free to reach out. You know, there are a lot of issues with regard to the information that's made available on your website and how you're protecting it. And, you know, it, in light of some major breaches that we're all very much aware of and your uses of information from entities like Equifax, it's all very important, but again, in the time that we have available for us this morning, it's not something that we are going to address. All right, so e-commerce, as I'm sure all of you know, is rapidly on the rise. You're going to have lots of demands from your customers, whether or not they are commercial customers, whether or not they're uh, tenants, individuals, as opposed to companies, all of them are demanding things at a faster pace, and all of that can be made available very quickly through uh, your website, making available information, making available applications, making available RFP data, making available portals for them to check on project status, and for the extent that you have tenants, payment portals, other tenant-based issues they might want to be able to utilize on a physical basis. 
personally, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know when the last time I, I sent a check for a kind of real estate purpose. I find it outrageous that Fairfax Water requires you to send checks as opposed to uh, having a, an online pot payment platform. And I think you'll see increasing demand for that type of engagement in a digital platform. So one of the most important aspects of your website, if you're going to have increased functionality, not just purely informational, you know, there are many websites that are purely static. You have basic information about your company, you have basic contact information, and otherwise the, the website doesn't have a ton of other functionality. As soon as you start adding some of that additional functionality, you want to make sure that you have some basic agreements in place with the people who come to your website and are using that website. One of the most important things that you may want to have in place is a terms of use or terms of service. Now, there's no legal requirement that you have one of these on your website. It is a document that entirely protects so that those individuals who come to your website are bound by some basic rules of the road. So take, for example, eligibility requirements and restrictions. You probably don't want to have anyone under the age of 13 wandering around your website because there are restrictions on that. The Child's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA, prohibits companies from collecting information about children, anyone under the age of 13. Other restrictions in states, such as Delaware, that say children is defined as anyone under 18. That's the type of thing you want to keep in mind. If you're not ready to comply with international requirements, you might want to state something clearly in your terms of service that says, if you're an international visitor to this website, understand this is subject to U.S. law and we're not uh, compliant with whatever laws may be where you're located. Those are the types of eligibility restrictions you want to put out there front and center. As far as intellectual property rights, what you put on your website is likely going to be protected and you want to assert those protections. You don't want people coming onto your website, scraping the data that you're making available to the public and using it for their own commercial benefit. That's the type of thing you want to preclude and state clearly in terms of service. If you're using third-party content that you've gotten from someone else, you probably want to protect that as well. Any information, say a blog, or a portal that you know, folks can upload comments or other thoughts to your website, you also want to make clear, is that their data? Is that your data? Are you allowed to use thoughts that they are presenting to you on your website for your own uses? You want to make that clear in your terms of use. User responsibility. You want to make clear, you know, to, there's, a, there's some laws that require that if you're going to prevent people from coming onto your website and basically taking all your data, you have to state that clearly in terms of use. Otherwise, you don't have that right anymore. You have to assert it. And you want to make sure that's clear. You want to make clear that those who come to your website can't upload malware, can't try to use your website to infiltrate your network, can't use that data to try to uh, commit any kinds of frauds or identity theft against other users. You know, one tenant might post something personal about themselves and another tenant decides to use that for their own nefarious purposes. Those are the types of things you want to make clear are not okay. Legal disclosures. Things like warranties, limitations of liability, indemnification. Say, for example, you make a payment platform available to your tenants so they can make payments on a monthly basis. On the last day of the month, for whatever reason, maybe there's a hurricane, your website goes down for that day, you want to have a uh, disclaimer that says, look, we're making this available to you. We can't guarantee it's going to be up 100% of the time. If you're going to make payments through this platform, you bear that liability. That if the website goes down the last day of the month and you submit it the next day, you know, that, that's on you. That's not on us. It wasn't our fault. So those are the types of things you also want to make clear in your terms of service. A website privacy policy is also very important. Unlike the terms of service, which are intended to protect you as a company, your website privacy policy is intended to protect the user of your website, those individuals who are coming and looking around on your website. And unlike the terms of service, which again is not required by law, there are certain states that strictly require that you must have a website privacy policy posted. California is one. 
Delaware is another. Nevada is the most recent. They just recently passed their law this year requiring that websites that are directed at Nevada residents have to have a website privacy policy. California and Delaware are a little bit broader. Basically, if the California resident comes to your website, you have to have those California protections in place. It doesn't matter whether or not you are seeking a California user or not. So keep in mind, all of those requirements are something you strictly need to apply for if you think anyone from California or Delaware might wander onto your website at some point. Some of those categories of information that you want to make available on your privacy policy, which are pretty basic, what types of information are you collecting about them? Are you collecting just name and address? Are you collecting just an email address to send them a newsletter? Are you collecting more information, payment information, health information? If someone has a disability and is submitting that as part of their application to be a tenant at your property, that might be sensitive health information you want to flag for them. Um, how you're using that data, how you're protecting that data, who you're sharing that data with. Are you sharing it with investors? Are you sharing it with other developers? So that's all the types of things that you want to disclose in your privacy policy, as well as different ways that your policy describes what you're doing with regard to tracking. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But keep in mind, under the, the requirements of the law, anything you describe in your privacy policy has to be accurate. You know, whether or not you want to mention something, whatever you say about it has to be correct. Uh, if your marketing department decides to make a change or enter into an agreement with a third-party service provider that you don't know about and it's not describing your policy, that could be an issue. If you enter into new, if you're, say, for example, you know, you're merging or being acquired by someone and that's not described in your privacy policy, that could be an issue. These are all things you want to think about. Other things that are happening within your organization can have an impact on your privacy policy, and if what you are saying you are doing does not match your actual practices, the primary federal agency in this space is the Federal Trade Commission. They can bring an enforcement action against you claiming that your statements made on your website are unfair or deceptive because they don't accurately describe what you're doing. Sure. You mentioned how there's different requirements in different states. So if you're a company that has, you know, multiple offices in other states, is the general rule of thumb then to go with whichever state has the strictest guidelines and comply that way? That's correct. Fortunately, in this space, unlike in others, uh, states are pretty lazy when they legislate. <laughs> so California was the first one. They issued an online website privacy policy statute that requires certain basic things. Delaware adopted it almost word for word. Nevada, when they uh, implemented their statute earlier this year, also implemented almost word for word. <laughs> so if you're complying with any one of those, you've got the states covered. But keep in mind that won't always be the case. You know, there, there could be additional states as time goes on that passes different requirements. But as of right now, as long as you're complying with California, you're pretty much covered. So websites are So, uh, because the website yeah. that we may post here or companies in the states either, but have a hosting provider that could be in California. Right. So, when, how does that, is it the corporate entity that created the website? It's uh, not. So, again, keep in mind the, uh, the privacy policy requirements are not designed to protect you, the company. They are your obligations to the people who come to your website. So, no, wherever that person is residing, if they are a California developer and come to your website or a California investor, you have to protect them based on their state of location, residence. Yes, Roger. Requirements 
Well, a couple thoughts on that. Some of the requirements are pretty straightforward. Like, you have to say what the effective date of your privacy policy is. So that's pretty straightforward. You should probably want that in your privacy policy anyway. Some of them are a bit more onerous and can be more complicated to implement. What you were saying as far as making clear the scope of your website may work in some states. For example, in Nevada, the language of their statute says that it only applies to websites that are directed at Nevada residents. So if, for example, you say this is not intended to be viewed by anyone in Nevada, that may work. California, being it's California, takes a more expansive view. Uh, and their attorney general, which can enforce their law, is very aggressive. Their law is written broadly, whereas anyone from California, if you have reason to believe anyone from California could come to your website, you need to be complying with their statute. Online contract formation. So the, there's an open question about enforceability of contracts when you don't have a wet signature. If you're going to try to enforce any of these provisions, either your terms of service or your privacy policy or other agreements that you may enter into, you know, app, again, applications, other types of services agreements that someone might be able to enter into on your website, you want to be able to make sure that those agreements are enforceable under the law. And this has been something that has been going on for a long time. You know, there's some recent cases up here, but you can see some of the early cases go all the way back to the early 2000s, that how you are implementing that process, when does the, when does the agreement text show up, how does it show up? You'll see here you know, a scrollable box that shows the text was held not to be enforceable because there was no reason, you know, there's no reason to believe that someone actually looked through all those provisions that were agreeing to those provisions. What they click on to move forward, does it say continue, does it say next, or does it say I agree? There's a clear statement by clicking on that that they are agreeing to something. That was this other case with Amazon, that there was a clear click that said you know, move forward and I agree. These are all issues that you want your web development team to really be thinking about so that there's no confusion between you and the party that you're entering into these agreements with what's happening and the scope of what's happening. So I have a quick question on that. Absolutely. When you talk about, I think most of us have been to this place where we see where in order to get to where you want to go, you have to push I accept or whatever. And, and I'm just going to throw myself out there and say that I really don't read it half the time. I just kind of scroll and click accept. Um, is there any type of a guidance about how the provisions are worded, meaning that, you know, I don't know that every audience is going to be able to interpret or understand the way that some of those disclaimers are worded. Mm -hmm. Is there any type of a, I mean, is there, has that ever come up before as an issue that they're, you know, using words that maybe not everyone um, would derive the same meaning from before we're pushing it? We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but yes, okay. that has come up frequently. You know, the fact that some privacy policies had reached 11 pages, which no one's really going to effectively understand when you're scrolling on a website. It's just, the reality isn't there. So there's different ways. Or if younger people are scrolling through, and sure. maybe they're 17 and they you know, haven't been to law school and they don't know the legalese that's included in the disclaimer. That's right. Well, there's a lot of different mitigating measures, right? And from the Federal Trade Commission's perspective and really most regulators' perspective, they're going to look at it from the totality of what's going on. Is it a scroll box? Is it a, a, a hyperlink that takes you to another site? Does it pop up as a PDF as opposed to one of those pop-up boxes that you can't print? You know, there are a lot of different factors that will impact whether or not a court will ultimately consider your agreements enforceable under the law. And what you're saying, you know, readability, accessibility, all of that is going to be very important in arguing at the end of the day, look, we made this completely available. They could save it. They could print it. They could view it. We gave them plenty of time, and there's an I agree button at the bottom. Those are all things that will lead, again, to enforceability. You know, there's some wiggle room there, right? Maybe you, you know, your functionality on your website doesn't permit that scroll. It just has to show the whole thing, and they have to go all the way through it. There's a lot of different ways that you can build these out, and at the end of the day, you just have to ask yourself, will that be enough, and will a court think that's Yeah. Uh, familiar with the term browser. Ah, so browse 
photograph is very much, I came to your website and I was browsing around. The website terms of service and the privacy policy appear in those little, you know, the table of contents there at the bottom. They're basically just made available to you as a user. That's browse wrap. Click wrap is when you are forced to say, I agree. Click on a button that I am agreeing to these terms of use. I am agreeing to this privacy policy. The one, the click wrap, is much more enforceable than merely the browse wrap, where it's down there at the bottom. This is something that came up very recently, again, in the, in the Equifax breach. The fact that to sign up for their credit monitoring product, if you're you know, a subject to, you know, impacted by what was going on there, at the bottom of the website, when you're signing up, there was a terms of service that included an arbitration provision that said you're basically signing away your rights to sue us if you accept our credit monitoring. Now, that was a browse wrap. It was just made available. You could review it if you had wanted to, if you were, you know, very, very careful. We're not all lawyers. <laughs> and they got a lot of heat for that. They have since stepped back and said we're not, you know, enforcing that against anyone in this situation. But that's the type of thing where you don't want someone to be able to question your method of how you are enforcing. I guess one other point I wanted to just point out, and this kind of connects our two practices. On the terms of use, one of the things that Kim had mentioned is this idea of protecting your data from third party use. I know for real estate people, um, a lot of times the various um, brokers and other sort of you know, people advertising for magazines might pick up things off of your website and republish them. And it would be good to make sure that you're addressing that. I know we had an issue come up in another project where the, um, the owners who were not happy with certain things that associated with the project were making statements that were based on various publications that were using information about the project that were not presenting it completely accurately or were taking things out of context and reprinting them. And then it seemed as if it was being you know, imputed to the developer who actually had it on their website originally. So it's interesting to be able to try to protect against that because, you know, our argument in this particular case was that, well, we didn't say any of those things. Those came from third parties, but the argument that they're making is, well, those third parties picked up various information off of your publication. Um, so it's interesting that your terms of use could protect you against those certain things like that that other people are, are, you know, are posting that may not be 100% Thanks, Sheila. It's a great real-life example. Um, one of the things you might want to think about implementing on your website is something called eSign. It's the Electronic Signatures Act. It was implemented way back in 99, I think. It, it, it is intended to be a method, a path forward for you to ensure that your electronic agreements are being honored. And it is a process by which you get someone's consent to provide electronic disclosures and to have, uh, again, a click represent their electronic signature. Now, there's a lot of different requirements and steps as far as what needs to be disclosed and how you need to implement it, but it is intended to be very business friendly. It applies to consumers, to commercial transactions, and to other business contexts. So you can use it in all different uh, contexts as long as you're implementing correctly. And we can talk about that more, but in terms of time, we're going to keep moving. Internet advertising. Uh, keep in mind that all the rules of the road that apply to print advertising will apply in the digital context. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not saying anything that's deceptive, that's anything that's incorrect, that any disclosures you're making about your claims are clear and conspicuous. You know, they need to be very, uh, the proximity of those disclosures need to be very close to whatever claims you're making on the Internet. They can't be, you know, you can't have, you know, pink disclosures against a red background. <laughs> you want to make sure that they're visible. Um, you can't flash up the disclosures at the same time. You're, you have a very active video showing over here. It's like, look over here, but not over here. Uh, <laughs> these are all the types of things that uh, regulators look very closely at. Again, it's also a totality of circumstances approach. They just want to make sure that whatever you're saying is being represented accurately. You're not deceiving anyone 
by what you're putting out on your website. Substantiation of claims, endorsement, and testimonials. If you have residents that you want to use quotes and put that on your website, there's a lot of different guidelines around how you do that, what types of consent, how long they can be posted, that type of thing. Again, in the interest of time, we're not going to go through all that, but if you're thinking about going down that road, you want to make sure that you have legal counsel that can assist you in, in implementing that program appropriately. Uh, native advertising. Um, this is advertising that appears on the Internet that people don't know is an advertisement. For example, on Instagram, someone might post a picture of themselves wearing a dress, but they don't say that ABC store gave them that dress to wear and to post it on Instagram. It looks like just organic content that someone has posted online, but really it's not. It was paid, it was you know curated, and then posted in a very strategic way. If you're doing things like that, again, there's a lot of guidelines about how to do that, and you want to uh, have outside counsel assist you with that. And again, we had mentioned COPPA earlier. Anything directed at children has very strict requirements around that, whether or not you want to advertise that your property has a great uh, playground or whatever else. Um, if you want to upload any kind of games that your tenants' children can play on your website, these are things you want to have very, very strict controls around. Is that applied to social media as well? It does. Okay. Which we're going to talk about in just a second. Okay. Diana, you're, you're just right ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not necessarily an issue. Some of the things you want to think about there, especially for property images, right? You want to get their permission, right? Right. Do they, right, do they want you to be posting right. images that show them? Right. Supply the photos because this right. is our approved or whatever. Sure. And if there's any kind of approval process, you know, making sure that their image is shown right. in the right context on your website, that kind of thing. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I think it's not a problem. Online behavioral advertising. This is a, it's a method by which you basically track individuals over time and across different websites, right? Maybe your property wants to target readers of the New York Times who shop at Nordstrom, who uh, buy their groceries at Whole Foods. If that's the type of thing that you want to do and you want to target advertisements about your property to those types of individuals, Again, lots of legal requirements and boundaries around that type of activity, lots of disclosures that need to accompany that type of activity. So keep in mind, again, if you're going to be implementing that type of program, something that you want to get legal counsel for. Self-regulatory principles. So there are a number of different trade associations that are active in this space. You know, I had mentioned the federal agency, the Federal Trade Commission. And they've been very clear, as long as the industry self-regulates, they're willing to take a step back and let the industry figure these things out. The Digital Advertising Alliance, the online, uh, various online advertising networks have all come together and issued very specific online advertising guidelines. So it's something that you want to keep in mind and potentially implement if you're going to be going down this road of posting Internet advertisements. Social media. So when you're thinking about entering into the world of social media, it seems like it would be very easy, and especially with younger folks, it just seems like I'm just going to post and it's going to be fine. That's incorrect. <laughs> There's a lot of legal boundaries that need to be kept in mind when you're engaging on social media. And you need to think about it in different ways and in different roles. So there are your corporate platforms. Right? So you know, your website might link to your Facebook page, your corporate profile on Facebook. They might link to your Twitter handle, your official corporate profile on Twitter. These are all things that you have very active control over. But you want to keep in mind, do you have any rules of the road with regard to your employees posting about this on their own time, on their own personal pages? If you haven't addressed this with your employees, you should. And then the question is whether or not you want to engage third-party sites, sites like Yelp that have increasingly broadened in their scope, where they first started out, I think, as like, you know, rating restaurants, 
They're now rating professionals. They're now rating properties. They're now rating all types of different entities. And do you want to engage? Do you want to respond to third parties' websites that are now social media platforms that can be talking about your property? But again, you can't control any of that. So do you want to engage in that or do you just want to you know, step back and not? These are all things you want to be thinking about on social media. Uh, not so much that, right? That's okay. just, it's like a share of someone else's content. Right. It's more along the lines of um, maybe you have an employee who's upset at you for some reason and post photos of mildew in, you know, uh, an area. Okay. Okay. Um, or, alternatively, an employee says something, maybe they think they're, they're, they're trying to help, and they make misstatements, broad statements about how great the property is that can be viewed as deceptive. Right. These well, all they, things, they yeah. can think that watching this is for them. Oh, this is a fantastic building, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. They, they could do any of these things. Right. And again, if they you have they're helping in it. Correct. Or you, you might be opening yourself to liability. Maybe they say, the reporter who wrote in this Washington Business Journal article is a liar. It's you know, I mean, you're <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're maybe opening your that, that employee again, thinking they're helping, might be opening you up to a lawsuit that you just don't want to be, you know, involved in. So, social media program practices. These are just all good practices that you want to think about to the extent you have the time and resources of implementing. Having a governance structure, having policies and procedures. If you're hiring a third party, like an advertising network, to act on your behalf, what kind of controls do you have over what they're doing? Uh, training your employees, having some oversight, doing some audits. You know, take a look at all of your social media posts. Do those really conform with what your vision is for how you're engaging social media? Um, and then evaluating whether or not your social media approach is the correct one for your company. So any of your outreach to the public through social media, and that could be your own posts. It could be advertising. You, know, you may per, you may do ad buys through Facebook or Instagram. All of that would be social media engagement. The Consumer Review Fairness Act. This was something that was enacted by Congress. Essentially, it just prohibits you from entering into contracts, say with your tenants, that prohibit them from having a voice. It's basically exercising their first part. Uh, first First Amendment rights online to issue complaints about you. You have there are restrictions on your ability to stop someone from engaging in that type of activity. So I'm going to turn it back over to BC now to address uh, ADA accessibility issues on websites. All right. So we're probably switching gears pretty dramatically here. There we go. Okay. So it's, my part is to talk a little bit about the public-facing websites that you have that um, where you're actually sharing information with the public about goods or services that you provide. So these are websites where it's not necessarily another business is looking at or accessing your website, but where members of the public are getting information from your website about what you do or about the services that you offer. And there are um, lots of rules, um, formal and informal, about those types of interactions. Um, so what I'll start with is just the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and, and how it affects websites. Is everybody familiar with some of the barriers that a person with a disability might encounter on a website? You want me to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So sometimes, you know, it's something that maybe people haven't really thought about. So one, one of the things I like to do is just to sort of say, imagine how you use the Internet. So if you're anything like me, you, you probably are on Amazon daily. Um, and you're, you might be buying, anything like me, grocery, shoes, you know, whatever Amazon sells <laughs> is in my house. Um, <laughs> But if I were blind or if I had a, a visual impairment other than wearing glasses, 
when I go to Amazon's website, what do I see, quote unquote? You know, what am I interacting with? On Amazon's website, immediately there are all these images. And if I'm blind or if I have no vision, I am interacting with Amazon's website with a tool called a screen reader. And so I go on my computer and I have a screen reader that reads the words to me on the screen. And so if Amazon has pictures on its website of, you know, the laptop I want, <laughs> this laptop, or, you know, whatever you might buy on Amazon, if that picture doesn't have what's called an alternative text tag, so if there isn't a picture that says Dell laptop, then my screen reader doesn't even know that there's anything there. It's almost as if it's just an empty space. And what the Americans with Disabilities Act essentially is saying is when a person with a disability goes to a website, they should be able to interact with that website and get the same type of information just like you or I would. Um, so they should be able to know, for example, that there are images that are meaningful on the website and what those images are. Um, if, they, if the person with a disability has a um, physical impairment that prevents them from using a keyboard um, so, or, or a mouse, so maybe I can't just curve my hands around a mouse to click through and all I'm doing is using one finger to push a button, is your website navigable in that way? So is it easy for me to jump from menu item to menu item at the top of the screen without using a mouse? Um, if you have, do any of your public facing websites have a form? So forms are sort of the, the enemy of the ADA in many ways because forms often are not labeled. So you have a form that you want everybody to fill out on your website, but for each of those boxes, maybe you have in really sort of light gray font where a space where it says first name or last name or address or whatever other information. If I have a visual impairment, I have no idea what information you want to put in that form unless you've labeled the form to say last name, first name in some way. And so those are really common barriers. If you have video content or any kind of audio content on your website, if, there, if it isn't captioned, then a person who is deaf or hard of hearing has no idea what information you're trying to communicate. Or if you think about the example that Kim gave earlier with the PDF, the privacy policy popping up as a PDF, if the PDF hasn't been created to be accessible, then a screen reader cannot read it, and then suddenly you are facing a potential lawsuit where a plaintiff is telling you that you they can't access your privacy policy, which is one of the realities that, that we're facing now. Um, and then at the end, I have other WCAG non-performance issues, which probably sounds very mysterious, but I, I'll, I promise you I'll explain it shortly. <laughs> so un, under the, the ADA, um, as I explained, it applies to public-facing websites, um, and it applies to entities called places of public accommodation. Um, so that's anybody who effectively who is selling goods to, um, to the public or providing services to the public. Um, if you go to the ADA regulation, which is sort of where many people would start or many lawyers would start, and, and try to understand, well, what are the requirements? How do I make my website accessible to people with disabilities? If you read the entire law, the word website, there's no way. Um, it was created in 1990. If you think back to 1990, you probably were not interacting with websites and the internet the way we are today. And so there is, there's just nothing in the actual statute that says it applies to websites or explains how you make a website accessible. And so since about 2010, the federal government has been trying to come up with a way, an explanation for how to make websites accessible, to come up with a rule. And for the last seven years, they've been un completely unable to do it. And um, just last month, the current administration announced that it was placing the web accessibility rulemaking on the inactive list. So this, essentially, this administration has thrown up its hands and said, we're not even looking at this. Um, but 
what is, so you would think that that means that you don't have to worry about your website. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The litigation in this area now is through the roof. Plaintiffs' firms, advocacy groups, and then individuals with disabilities are filing lawsuits coast to coast almost every day, either filing lawsuits or issuing demand letters saying, you need to make your website accessible and you need to make it accessible now because I am unable to use this service that you're providing. I can't access this information and that's discriminatory under the ADA. And also ironically, even though the Department of Justice has not created a rule, it was also, up until January, actively enforcing the ADA in this area. So there are no requirements. The word website doesn't apply, doesn't exist in the ADA, but the Department of Justice is actually targeting entities and saying, you need to make your website accessible. Um, under the theory that the ADA was drafted to be very broadly um, interpreted and to be flexible and should adapt with the time. And essentially, the position that the DOJ has taken, courts have taken, advocacy groups have taken is that the internet is such an integral part of our lives that it would be incredibly discriminatory for people with disabilities not to be able to access this information. So what are you supposed to do then to make your website accessible? There is um, a set of guidelines called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the WCAG Guidelines. And what they are is an international standard that essentially everybody in the world agrees is the way to make your website accessible. And it goes through um, 12 sets of rules um, that, that websites need to incorporate to make a website accessible. So things like I talked about earlier, like putting alt tags on images on your website, things like captioning videos, things like making sure that the color contrast on your website is such that it can be readable, that um, websites can be zoomed. You know how sometimes um, when you zoom out and make a, um, the text on your website larger, it becomes so blurry and hard to read. There are rules around that also saying even when you zoom out, it still needs to be readable. And so that's what the web content accessibility guidelines do. And there's three levels. There's level A, level AA, and level AAA. And there's general agreement that it's essentially impossible to achieve tri AAA performance. And so um, what the government has required and um, courts have required is compliance at both the A and AA levels. Um, which is a pretty high um, high level to, to comply with. Does anybody have questions so far? I know it's early and I'm sort of not speaking English anymore. <laughs> Are you good? Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's let's look at some of the recent litigation in this. Oh, yes. Yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. You said that AAA is pretty much unattainable. Why does it exist then? It's like the it's sort of a dream. Okay. Um, so <laughs> in, in, in the ideal world, it's sort of you know if we had unlimited resources mm -hmm. and could you know do everything you wanted on a website, mm -hmm. this is what we would do. And but even those requirements, I mean it would be time consuming, it would be difficult. And then sometimes it's not even feasible technologically. So sometimes you might be using a platform that doesn't allow you to do some of the things that you're required to do at the triple A level. Because if you think about your website, you are creating your website for use on Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox. So you need it to work with different browsers. You also might be doing it on your mobile app. So you want it to work on iOS and Android. And so you have all these things that you're trying to juggle all at the same time at three levels of performance in addition to everything Tim's talked about. And so at that point, you know, something has to get to Okay. So, so let's talk about the, the Domino's Pizza case first. And I like to start with this one because it sort of makes you feel good as, as a business entity. And it makes you feel like there's hope, oh, right? Um, so what <laughs> happened in, in Domino's Pizza was that um, a person with a visual impairment, so somebody who is blind, tried to place an order on Domino's Pizza's website. And... Um, they go to the website, and, and the website is inaccessible to their screen reader. So they can't read, you know, what number to dial. They can't read the pizza options or the toppings. And, and they somehow are connected with a plaintiff's firm 
um, and there are many of these who are very active in the space right now, and the plaintiff firm says, yes, I can help you. And they sue Domino's Pizza, and they say, look, we tried to use your website, we tried to use your mobile app, it wasn't, I, we couldn't use it with this screen reader, and so you are discriminating against this member of the public on the basis of his disability. Um, it, it goes to court, um, Domino's Pizza files a motion to dismiss and says, look, we have given, oh, and one thing I'll say is after, after the lawsuit was filed, Domino's very quickly on its website put up a banner that said, if you have trouble accessing our website, call this number or call, call your local store, someone will have to help you there. And so Domino's says, look, we have this statement that's explaining to you how you can get help if you need it. Um, we also don't think that the ADA applies to us in this context, but what is the clear rule about how to fix our website? Show me the regulation, essentially, that tells me what I need to do under the ADA to comply. There's no rule. Um, and the court said, you know what, Domino's, you have a really good point, right? If this person goes to your website, there's information that gives them an alternative. And what the ADA says is you have to communicate effectively with people with disabilities, but it doesn't say exactly how. So if you've given them one way, that's pretty good. They can call the store, right? That sounds completely reasonable. Um, and the court said, yeah, you know, we see that the DOJ has been involved in this rulemaking for years and hasn't done anything. So why should we? You know, the government's job is to make rules, so let the government make rules. And when the rules are in place, we'll help with the interpretation. That's our job. Um, and, and the court and the plaintiff's firm said, but look, the DOJ has been so active in this area. Look at all these settlement agreements it's entered into with covered entities, with PPOD, with cruise lines. I mean, everybody's entered into a, an agreement with the DOJ saying they'll make their website accessible. They're consent decrees. And the court says, yeah, that's all really nice, but there's still no rule. You know, those things are just not persuasive to us because the government has had an opportunity to make a rule and it's chosen not to do that. And so we're not going to try and figure out by cobbling together settlement agreements and, and consent decrees exactly what the DOJ's intentions are. And so you feel good, right, at this point? Since then, um, and that was in March, um, exactly, so <laughs> there's nothing but bad news left on my slide. <laughs> um, there was a pretty big case out of Florida called the Winn-Dixie case. I don't know if any of you have heard about this case. It was sort of, it was sort of a big game changer for plaintiff's firms recently. And even before these recent cases, you know, the, the circuits were split, California and the Ninth Circuit was going one way, the First Circuit and, and the Second were going a different way. But then with Winn-Dixie, I think it, it really became very concrete because there was an actual trial. And it's the first time that we are aware of that this ADA website accessibility issue has actually gone to trial. And it did not end well for, for the business. Um, as you can imagine, this is, courts are really empathetic to plaintiffs on this issue. You know, you have somebody who in Winn-Dixie is blind and who is saying, look, I can't drive. I can't drive to the grocery store. This grocery store has a way for me to order my prescriptions online to make my life easier. Um, I am exactly the kind of person who should be benefiting from these online services. There's a way to make this website accessible, and this company has essentially chosen not to do that. And so you, you're, we're starting to see sort of a lot of anger in some cases from judges and sort of a, a, um, an unwillingness to accept some of the arguments that we saw in, in the um, domino pizza case. And essentially in Winn-Dixie what the court said is, this website is inaccessible. We've had expert testimony. Um, your website has been scanned, and it just doesn't, you know, this person's screen reader just doesn't work with the website. And the court said, given that, what we're going to do is we are going to require you, so that, you know, they find that there's a, a violation of the ADA. We're going to require you to do certain things to, um, to make your website accessible. Um, and under the ADA, you, there, isn't, there aren't so huge suits 
for um, big damages, what you get are two things. Um, reasonable reimbursement of attorney's fees of the plaintiff's lawyer, and then you get injunctive relief. So you are required to take action to fix um, the accessibility barrier. And, and what the court said is you need to create a website accessibility policy that adopts the WCAG 2.0 criteria that we just talked about. So the court is saying the government hasn't said that this is what the rule is, but we're telling you this is what you need to use to make your website accessible. Um, the, the court also said, you know, part of the argument often is, but this part of our website is controlled by a third party, right? So you enter in information into this form and it goes somewhere else. The form is some kind of plug-in from someone else. It's not even really ours. You know, everything that we control is, is accessible. Why are you picking on us, essentially? And the court said, no, you go back to your third party vendor and make sure they are conforming with the ADA so that your whole website is accessible. Um, put a statement on your homepage that communicates to the world what your policy is on accessibility and how to um, get help if there's a barrier. And then also look at your IT stock. Like, do they have training on this issue? Are they monitoring? Are they testing on an ongoing basis? You know, who is creating and developing your website and, and what's their knowledge base on this issue? And so these are the things that, that the Winn-Dixie Court said in June. And as you can imagine, there have been lots of lawsuits filed since then. Um, so let's, you, you, you okay? You switch fields for the next round? <laughs> yes? Okay. All right. So post Winn Dixie, there were, um, there were a couple of significant cases out of New York. And um, the New York court sort of followed the same, the same line. So one of these cases I'm sure you've heard of, if you're like me and enjoy as a burger, you know, about five guys. Um, the, the second is Blick Art Materials, which is, um, if you have kids, you might either coloring pencils and other paper uh, art supplies. They come from Blick Art. And, and both of these entities have websites. Um, and, and their websites were targeted um, as, as inaccessible. And, and what, the, um, what both entities argued were the same arguments, similar arguments to what we've seen in, um, in Winn-Dixie, or in Winn-Dixie and then also in Domino's Pizza. ADA doesn't apply to us. There's nothing in the ADA that says that, the, that websites are covered. Um, there was also an argument about nexus. Um, one, one of the issues that comes up sometimes is whether you have a physical location that's open to the public that provides the same services that your website does. So there are some entities that say, we don't even have a building that the public can come into. All we have is this website. How does the ADA apply to us if the ADA covers places of public accommodation? The Ninth Circuit out in California loves that argument and requires the nexus. But then there are lots of courts that just say, no. It doesn't matter whether you're online only. It doesn't matter if you have a physical location. You need to um, read the ADA as broadly as possible, and the ADA applies to websites, even if you're an online only entity. And so um, we saw that in a case. There's a case that there were cases involving Netflix, where the California court said to Netflix, "Oh no, there's no nexus. You don't have a physical location. All your Goods are online, so you, the ADA doesn't apply to your website. Then on the other side of the country, Netflix again gets told it doesn't matter if you have a physical location or not. You need to caption your um, DVDs and your um, movies that you stream online. So what do you think that means for Netflix as a business? All their movies are captioned, right, because they are a national company. So. In, in these new cases, the court got even tougher, even more specific. And the court said, your website must be ADA compliant. There's no nexus requirement. 
And then they say the opposite of California. They say, do not wait for the DOJ to promulgate regulation. Your compliance obligation is now. And so your website should, as it stands today, should be accessible. Um, and, and the Five Guys Court says, you should go ahead and rely on the WCAG standards, recognizing that, you know, the government hasn't endorsed these um, formally in, you know, under the ADA, but those are the standards that we have and that can make your website accessible. So those are the standards that you should use. And in Five Guys, they said, look, why are you dinging us? We're already fixing our website. It takes time. You know, sort of being nice to us, essentially. And, and the court said, we're not looking at whether you're working on your website and what you've done so far. What we're looking at is whether this person who is blind has, and with their screen reader trying to access your website can access your website today. And so there was a very inflexible standard articulated by these two courts, essentially saying, make sure your website is accessible. And so if you look at this quote from, from the um, Blick Art Court, it gives you a sense of where courts are going on this issue. And if you look at some of the words that they're picking, that the court is picking, it's saying like it would be cruel. It's talking about emancipation and isolation and segregation. And, and these are really sort of emotional terms, right? And terms that you, I mean, it almost sounds like you are in the 60s, right? Or, you know, it's, it's, it's a very different way of thinking about websites. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to look at this language and to get a sense of how judges are reacting to, on this issue and sort of the strength of, of that reaction and what that could mean if a judge gets information that suggests that your website is inaccessible and how they're going to interact with that information. Okay, so, so the next part is to talk about litigation. And then I have this big problem I should have told you about in the beginning. Like I have no sense of time, and there are no clocks in this room. It's now 9.30. We're almost at the end. So we're so done. done. <laughs> 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 so you stop talking. I, mean, it I, was like, I think we looked a panic to my right. Um, so why, why don't I do this? Um, because as you can tell, I can talk about this stuff all day, right? Um, so why don't I jump? I think I've woven the litigation piece throughout. Why don't I jump to some of the practical um, questions that you should be thinking about with regard to your website? Um, one is making sure that there is somebody within your enterprise who is thinking about this. So do you have an ADA coordinator? Do you have someone who is focused on compliance in this area? Because you're going to need somebody to make sure that this is happening. Right. Just really quickly, yeah. who typically is the person assigned in, at a company to deal with this? Outside, I mean, I would assume maybe some HR people, but are there other kind of titles or people that? So it depends on the size of your enterprise. It's often somebody in who already has a compliance role, and this is typically added on um, as, as one of the responsibilities. Um, and then the other thing I would encourage you to think about is what you're communicating to the public about on this. So think about the Domino's pizza case. You know, one of the things that the court liked about Domino's and that other courts like to see is if you have some sort of communication to the public about what to do if they encounter barriers on your website. So it's not just that your website is inaccessible and there's nothing else to do, but your website, we're working on our website now. If you're having trouble, this is the number to call. This is the email address to go to. And then what's your internal policy on this issue? What are you doing to make sure that as your website is developed, your website is developed to incorporate the WCAG guidelines? Um, one of the things that's targeted in this litigation is whether there is a corporate policy on digital accessibility. So that's something else to think about. And then the next thing to think about is whether the people who are charged with uh, making websites accessible understand their role. So do the IT stop, and this is, again, an emerging issue. You may find that the people on your development team don't know how to do this. And so you may need to go outside to find someone who can actually help you. Sometimes your IT people may not sort of confess early on that they know. Sometimes you get people say, oh, yeah, we can fix this. We can do this. And then they try, and your website isn't accessible. 
So just make sure that the person who is doing it actually has enough training. Um, and then the other thing I would say is make sure you know where your vulnerabilities are. What are the risks on your website? Um, I, I really recommend um, conducting a privileged assessment of your website. Um, you know, there are publicly available tools I can share with you if you want. You can go, you can run your website, you can see where your website is. But given the amount of litigation that we're seeing in this area, it's really risky to do a lot of the assessment yourself because essentially what you're doing is creating a trail that shows your non-compliance. And then if you're sued, somebody comes in and says, oh, thank you for doing this internal audit or, you know, contracting with this vendor. I'll just take that report that the vendor gave you showing every single page that has something wrong with it and hand that over to the court and say you proved your own case. And so I really encourage you to do this on a privileged, privileged basis. What I typically do when I work with um, clients is I retain the vendor and I ask the vendor to conduct the audit and to give me information so that I can advise my client. And then that way we can have an argument that it is privileged and shouldn't be made available to plaintiff's counsel. Um, we talked a bit about vendor relationships already and, and um, training. And then the other piece I'll just talk about really quickly is once you have your compliance program in place, websites are not static. And so there's constantly new content being added, new templates being created. Everybody loves a redesign. Make sure that it is front and center as changes are made to your website also, which is why it's really important to have the digital accessibility policy internally also. All right, and I promise you I'm done. I'll talk about it. So one other question, sort of comment. I know when the um, ADA first came out, um, there were a lot of um, pro bono sort of um, public interest law firms out there that were sort of tolling um, the you know various sales and you know, sales offices and you know, other real estate organizations that were you know either renting or selling. They were kind of like the testers. Test, yeah, testers that would you know sort of try to find your violations and then that would be the test case that they would bring against that particular, and I, I, that was really active, I'd say, probably in the early 90s when things first started happening, um, you know, under ADA. Is that happening in the website field now, too, where they, you know, they've, they've kind of done their job uh, on the physical attributes of the project, and now they're focusing more on the digital attributes? Yeah, so, I mean, we still see the the, 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 the physical accessibility cases, you know, a class action just walk in. I think yesterday or two days ago, uh, you know, with one of the, actually one of the same firms that does the website cases also sort of folds and does the drive-by physical cases. But these are also very easy to do on a drive-by basis. I mean, if you all if you came and sat by me at the end of this presentation, within under five or ten minutes, I could go to your website and tell you if you have accessibility barriers using a free tool. And so it doesn't take a long time to identify the barriers or to identify targets. And they do it all the time. And what they do often is sort of industry by industry. You know, this week it's retail, next week it's banking. And they just sort of go through and then they just target a lot of websites. They send out a lot, lots of demand letters. If you don't respond to them, they sue you. And it's, it's not that expensive for them. Is it, is it mostly driven from business to client or is it an issue? Mainly business to client. That's the primary focus. We have a lot of uh, international data in our website, and you talked about earlier the policy thing that's currently in the U.S. audience. Is there any sort of requirement to offer a license option? As far as foreign language access, it's not a requirement. Uh, certainly for any international applicants who have, one of the surest and best ways of uh, ensuring that you're protected is to get their clear consent. You know, understand you're an international applicant, you're coming to my website, it doesn't comply with whatever international law may apply to you, and you're consenting to proceed forward um, and submit your application information. Find that. But, you know, that being said, I think what I would say on that is that there certainly are language access issues domestically that could um, to raise concerns for international so you may have um, sort of obligations to provide information in Spanish or some other language that is um, 
frequently spoken in a particular area in which you're doing business, and you know, that information could be right. So yes, there's no strict requirements. You offer any language, but once you go down that road, you have to have full conversion, right? So if you're going to have an application that's written in Spanish, but the disclosures are written in English or the privacy policy is written in English, and they're not getting a full picture of what is applying to an individual. So again, like Spanish, French, whatever. Like once you go down that road, it has to be complete conversion. Otherwise, you, anyone could argue why they didn't understand that particular term to be one that was right. And so uh, what I'll say on the languages, depending on the context, I think, in, for, the, for real estate entities, depending on like your source of funding, whether it's coming from the federal government for a particular project and things like that, you may have obligations under Title VI to provide language access in certain contexts. Um, but that's different from the Okay, we mentioned real quick about um, e signs and that um, something I've seen a lot of the Adobe e sign or um, going through and, um, portals of like and um, I guess two pieces of time, both conversations. One, should we be able to assume, probably not assume, that those portals are accessible to anybody who comes to visit? But then also, if someone actually does do it, is that enforceable or just as enforceable as getting original signatures you have to get on your loan documents and keep it a safe somewhere until your loan? ESI is intended to be an exact replacement for a web signature. That's how it's intended to be applied, and you have to implement it correctly. Now, you can use third-party ESI providers. DocuSign is probably the largest player in this space, and they're very aware that they need to do things in a way that is compliant. The way that it touches on what BC was talking about is one of ESI's requirements is that you have to obtain consent from whoever, a consumer, from another business, whoever, in a way that reasonably demonstrates that they can see and receive any future disclosures that you may provide to them. So, and I see a lot of companies do this wrong, right? Like they think they'll display their e-sign disclosures and click OK, but if you can't show that your PDF is accessible to them, or if you're going to be sending them an email uh, with the disclosures, you don't verify that the email they provided is valid and they can receive those emails in the future. These are all barriers to the enforceability of uh, the e sign data. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Well, we thank you all for coming. Um, hope you guys got a lot of information out of it. Um, I'm sure that um, BC is going to be happy to answer any other questions that you have or follow up. Um, and uh, we appreciate you explaining it. Thank you. Thank you.